Hello, welcome to the show narrative. I'm Neri and finally, 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 after many months of having finished this duology, the Six Crimson Cranes duology, I'm going to review it because I've always intended to and I finally made the time. It feels so good to do a review that's not a cozy mystery review. I love those, but this is refreshing. <laughs> so this duology starts with the Six Crimson Cranes and then it goes to The Dragon's Promise, and they are both by Elizabeth Lim. And this duology is really good. I'm going to say that. It's really good. I am going to go into some spoilers. If you want to read the book and you don't want to hear spoilers, I would say this is probably not the video for you. But if you don't care or you've read it and you just want to see what somebody else's take on it is, here it is. So The Six Crimson Cranes, the first book, follows Shiori, who is our main character. She lives in Kiata, a kingdom that forbids magic, but she herself has magic. Come to find, her stepmother also has magic, but it's a dark type of magic. And whereas her stepmother, Raikama, has had time to get used to that magic, Shiori has such spikes of power that she sometimes loses control of her magic. One day her stepmother uses her magic to banish Yuri. Not only that, she turns her brothers into cranes. She's got like six brothers. They are now cranes, <laughs> okay? But they're not cranes in like the whole time in the book they're cranes. They have time of day where they are cranes and then later they turn human. Meanwhile, Shiori, who is a very, very outspoken character, is cursed with not being able to speak or else one of her brothers will die. I know, so dramatic. But wait, the book starts with Shiori's betrothal, that is a hard word to say, betrothal ceremony, and she is making her way there but she has a magical little paper crane that flies away for her, from her. They both end up in a lake, and she's saved by a dragon that nobody knows is in the lake. But also, given that there's not really supposed to be magic in the kingdom, he's really not supposed to be in the lake. Now, she's also, by accidentally drowning, has also embarrassed her entire family because they thought that she did this to get out of getting married, which she's not keen on getting married to someone that she doesn't know. That's perfectly fine, but that th she is not that dramatic. They think she's that dramatic. She's not that dramatic. It wasn't even like that, to be honest. To be fair to her, the author lays out how each and every prince has a role, or later in the book he can choose a different type of role, but the younger you are, in the family line, and also if you are not a son, it, it really becomes less of a choice and really a diplomatic marriage type of thing. After she meets the dragon and befriends him and he tells her how he saved her life, he teaches her a little bit about magic and then he says, oh, I gotta go. My grandfather is um, expecting me. Like, the dragons live under the sea. So he has to go to the sea to go to the court there. So he is leaving for her for a certain amount of time. During the time that he's gone, that's when Raikama finds out about Shiori's magic and banishes her and her brothers. This was really, really confusing to me because it sounds like, oh, what a conundrum, but it's not like she spelled the rest of the kingdom where like Sleeping Beauty fell asleep and therefore everybody else fell asleep for a hundred years. It wasn't like that. You, so, so now you have like six missing princes, including the crown prince and a missing princess, like the whole royal family, all the offsprings are just gone. No explanation. Yes, people are looking for them, but at the same time, it's like, there is no way that this kingdom has not had a bigger breakdown in trying to find the missing royal family members. And there was not more of a question 
of how the kingdom was going to survive if the king passes. Because Raikama has no children of her own. So he may have to take another bride. He may have to get some more offspring, I guess. It was, it was just a huge plot hole that to me, even if you have this fantastical curse where, you know, the brothers are turned into cranes and the princess can't speak a word about it because if she does, one of them will die each time she utters something. Throughout the book, by the way, she makes sounds. She just can't say anything. Um, but she's so paranoid about it that she doesn't make sounds. She also has a giant bowl on her head to disguise her as part of her curse. That bowl plays such an important part in this book. It's crazy. It's crazy. And people have tried to pull it off her head. It does not come off. Which fair enough, because if had it come off, then she would have been found a lot sooner and possibly by enemies, because there are factions that are trying to use the moment of the royal family is weak to take over, because of course they would, but it's really not in the way that you would expect, and it's really, it's really a B-plot in this book. It's really kind of nothing gets pushed to the side because of who plans it. Now let's talk a little bit about Shiori's fiance. Shiori's fiance is Taken, and he he is rumored <laughs> to be very fierce, but they do end up meeting in this kind of restaurant in type establishment that she's a cook at and she makes one dish very well, which is her mother's like fish bone soup also very important to the story. I do like how the author kind of like sews everything in together, but unfortunately the pacing is inconsistent and I really lose track of time whenever it comes to something happening like kind of action-y, right? We have the curse. There's a lot of action there because she is fully separated from her brother. She has to find them. Meanwhile, she has to live with a bowl on her head, which people think is very, very weird and may even be like a sign that you shouldn't be around her. And she has to make a living, which she doesn't, she hasn't had to do in her entire life. So she makes this suit. Unbeknownst to her, her fiance has been searching for her. He has someone working with him who is very brash and she doesn't like him. And he pretends to be Takan, but then later she finds that it's actually this very kind general who, you know, actually treats her with a degree of respect that she's like, okay, I guess he's not so bad. Which at first I was like, oh no, because I was rooting for her in the dragon. But the dragon, I believe his name is Seryu, um, he does not make too much of an appearance in the rest of this particular book just because he is in court and he is being like watched at all times and he tries to make time to like meet up with her understand the situation and help her but it's hard so let's fast forward a little bit she eventually meets her brothers well now that she's found her brothers they have to hatch a plan the brothers tell her okay there's this type of material they're basically like needles is how i could describe them it's very painful for people to touch. A lot of people probably couldn't even do it. And you have to weave it into a net. And then they'll cast that net over the stepmother and say her real name. And that will break the curse, but it will also kill her. But then they go out and they search. So they find this material. And it's not material that mortals are allowed to have. It's really something that the Dragon King is against, so he comes out of the ocean. There's no other reason why six cranes and a girl would get away from a dragon while flying if there wasn't a reason for him to stop. But which, by the way, I think it's also because she promises him the pearl. Because the reason that her stepmother has magic is because she has a dragon's pearl. It's very rare, but humans can be born with a dragon's pearl. So that was just very interesting to me, but 
Anyway, she makes that promise. He, like, backs off a bit. They go, and she starts weaving this net. But she's also getting a little stir-crazy. She's like, my brothers are out there doing everything, and I'm just here, and I don't know how I will get this net done because it's, it's excruciatingly painful for her. She's, like, burning her hands, and there's, like, blood and stuff and cuts because she's trying to weave this net. And then it starts to get confusing again. Like, the minute she gets into some situation where she is taking a lot of action for some reason, it's the timeline starts to blur, and I don't know how long it is. She leaves the cave that they're in, gets caught by the arrogant jerk whose name I cannot remember, and basically she's hauled back to their fortress. Fortunately, her fiancé shows up and is like, oh, I recognize her. And she also makes some allies among the people who are there, but they're very cautious about her. They think that there's something wrong with her because she doesn't speak and there's a bowl on her head. And it sucks because what are you going to do? You can't speak and there's a giant bowl on your head. But I do like these obstacles for her, but again, I don't, I don't know what my timeline is here. Ultimately, I don't even know how long it was that she stayed with them. Because it felt like she could have been there three months with how slowly everything was progressing. She even went out on, like, little, like, bonding trips with her fiancé and his sister in the midst of having so much on her shoulders. She knows that something is wrong with the household. And then I think that's where the story gets convoluted because then suddenly you have priestesses who took over somebody's body. She's pretending to be this girl who's a relative of the family, so then she has the leverage of saying, oh, this person is a traitor, this person is the reason why everything is going badly, here, let's kill them. And so she's being burned, and then that's when she finally makes like this sound like she speaks and you think her brothers die but they don't and immediately it just pivots to the bowl on her head is broken she can speak again her brothers are fine her fiance believes her he's happy he's found her oh and also the priestesses are in league with a demon who is in league with a court official. Now, the court official was like, yay, the royal family is in disarray. This is my time to make my move for the throne. So he allies with this demon. Of course, eventually the witch dies, but nobody is satisfied with that, and there's still a battle between the court official and the demon versus her, her brothers, and her fiancé. And, it, it, okay, so it's like a little fight, right? And the demon's like, oh, I don't need you, court official, anymore, kills the court official, uses his magic to really torture and hurt the, the Takan, the fiancé. And all because he wants her blood, essentially her blood, will release demons. And then he grabs her and he goes into, like, it's in the mountain where the, the um, demons are sealed. There's, like, a crack. And he goes in there, and then they get a little bit of a taste of her blood because, you know, she accidentally, like, was cut. She was cut and she had blood a little. And then she's pulled out of the mountain crack and oh it's her stepmom but her stepmom isn't evil it's just that the pearl's magic is unpredictable that even sh though she had years of working with it 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 does what it it wants still because it has its own will but also it's a broken pearl so it's even more unstable and unpredictable unfortunately the only way to break the curse is to kill her stepmother. 
And by, by now, in this short span of time, in which the demon who brought her into that mountain is wailing and trying to get at her because he needs all of her blood, not just a tiny droplet, and we have time, somehow, to discover her stepmom wasn't evil. <laughs> she did this to protect them. not her fault that the pearl will just take okay protect them and run with it anyway i i will say it is a really sweet mo moment there are so many good parts about this book but these parts that i'm mentioning like they're these big parts and i feel like i'm losing time because i don't understand the the time frame of this because when i'm reading it feels like I feel like it's slowed down. The pace is just like, we're lifting our leg. We're placing down the leg. And then we're putting weight on it. It is a step. But the stepmother's confession and everything was actually very, very sweet. And of all the relationships I really rooted for, I was really like, oh my god, I know that they said the way to stop the curse is to kill her but I really don't want her to die. I want her to live and thrive and mend her relationship with her stepkids because she deserves it. But that is not how the world works. And I rated this one a four out of five. I, I just, I think about it and I think it's probably more of a three, but I leave it at a four just because I like that the author does well with the emotional stuff. The detail is really good. It's just that pacing, man. That pacing and losing time just... It's not great. The only thing is it's more excusable in the second book. Because of course it happens in the second book. Now she's got this pearl that she has to return to a dragon. She doesn't know. She just has to find the owner. And thus, the dragon's promise. This book and this book, the vibes are totally different. Yes, our characters remain the same. But there's a, there's so much growth within the second book that we don't see in the first book. There's so much more dialogue between characters, so much more expanded relationships. And then we also get to explore the world of the dragons and what it means to be under the rule of Seryu's grandfather, basically. So she goes down there because she has to find the owner of the pearl. And the reason that I give the second book such a leeway when it comes to the pacing and loss of time is because it is explained that while she is underwater, time moves differently. So while it may be a few days underwater for her, much more time may have passed on the surface. In the dragon's kingdom, Shiori finds humans are very much in a way enslaved. It's it can be an uncomfortable read. I really like here how the dragons definitely have their own temperament, have their own hierarchies. Like the the world building of this book is really wonderful. Shiori straight up gets in trouble. Seryu like comes up with this idea where he's going to marry her and she protests then he has the audacity to come up come back and be like well obviously this wasn't gonna happen i wasn't gonna force you into this you should have trusted me you didn't include her in the plan you just expect her to like be okay with it after you have that conversation only a few minutes ago i will say dude is losing points with me but then we meet another dragon Mind you, a half-dragon, and that's why he's ostracized. He comes and tries to claim the pearl, just as the king tries to claim the pearl. And the pearl rejects them both. Shiori finds herself in the home of the half-dragon and sort of a little bit befriending him. Mind you, he's been ostracized for a, little, a really long time, and... Dragons have dragon-sized temperaments in this book, okay? 
I do like it. It's just a little infuriating. And, you know, it turns out that, yes, there were some feelings that Seryu had for Shiori, but Shiori has actually fallen in love with her fiancé and, and does plan to go back to him. And I'm like, everybody is so young, except that dragon in human years, you know? She manages to leave the dragon's kingdom alive and with the pearl, which I am surprised because, mind you, was she not bound to the fact that she told the dragon king, like, I'll get the pearl, you can have the pearl. But since she made um, an agreement with her stepmother that I'm going to find the pearl's real owner, which, by the way, everybody keeps warning her against finding the real owner because they know who the real owner is but won't say anything. Anyway, Seiyu ends up fighting the Dragon King and winning. And now he's his heir. Hooray! Can I have a spin-off series of, of just him because he's a fabulous character? I want to know all about him. So going back to our main story, Shiori resurfaces in more ways than one. And it's been a while and people have been concerned about her. Some of her brothers are either married or are getting married. Like, life has moved on without her because it has to. It's not going to stand still for her. She is also pretty much immediately a victim of an assassination attempt, and she doesn't know if it's the demon or if it's his brother's wife who, for no reason, just has a grudge against her, even though all she wants to do seems to be to get to know her younger sister. To her, she's like, okay, I believe that there's some possession here. But to everybody else, they're like, this looks weird. Either she has an issue with the sister-in-law and she's acting up, or the sister-in-law has an issue with her and she realized it. Like, it's a lot of little drama for no reason, except to add suspense that the, the demon is coming back. And he does, this time with an army, and he wants the pearl. He had some of her blood, not all of it, but now he wants the pearl. Or maybe he wants both. I, I don't think there's a scenario in his mind where she comes out of this alive if he wins. Now he wants the pearl. But she wants to find the owner of the pearl. So she, her brothers, and her fiancé hatch this plan. And they fly out to an island where they believe the owner is. And mind you, yeah, he's there. And the way I imagine him is definitely not anything like half a dragon. It's like, I picture him acting like, you know, a gargoyle from the show Gargoyles on this island filled with ghosts. Immediately, she touches down and there is a fight. The demon is there as well. I mean, the brothers turned back into cranes, flew them out there in a basket. They take a couple pit stops where she gets to learn a little bit more about her stepmother, which were my favorite parts. And then her fiance may or may not be possessed. He is absolutely possessed, but he's fighting it. And we all know from The Conjuring how that works out. Or, well, at least it's how I felt, but he was definitely a lot stronger than I gave him credit for. Anyway, they basically get to the island. The demon is also on the island because he's kind of possessing the fiancé. And the demons that come with the, the big demon, so we have lesser demons and he's the big guy in charge, they start fighting the ghosts. Apparently some of these lesser demons had also aligned with the owner of the pearl and he says to her that they've betrayed him. I also felt like he was kind of insinuating that it was her fault because she brought this about. She's trying to return the pearl to him. He's like, I don't want it. And then the pearl's like, I don't want him. And, and she's just like, this is not my issue. My thing was to return the pearl to its rightful owner. You need to make up by yourselves. This is like a divorced couple fighting, okay? And this is like, by that time, I was like, towards the end of the book, 
we're finishing up, we're, we're in our last battles, and oh my gosh, every frustration of the first book came rushing back to me, because how is she getting stretched so far, like, where, like, she's humanly being tortured, and she has to withstand that, and she's trying to figure